The Tom Woods Show, episode 1556. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Hope you enjoyed Gene Epstein week last week. How could you not? I even had people in my supporting listeners group say that when Gene proposed a uh, Gene Epstein month, I should have taken him up on it. <laughs> they would have gladly listened. So I hope you like that. I've got couple more ideas for theme weeks or a week where I do one particular guest and we just talk and talk and talk. It has to be a guest where it's plausible that I could get them on five times. Okay, so some of these guests where I'm lucky to have the person on once, I'm not going to be able to do a whole week. But I am planning to do that again. I just got back from the island of St. Lucia where I spent much of last week getting myself refreshed for 2020. And if you're on my entrepreneurship email list, you know about the birds I struggled against. My room didn't have a fourth wall on it because it's the idea is that you have this beautiful view and you're sort of half indoors and half outdoors. And I had birds flying in and out from time to time, normally when I had food out. It's, anyway, it's an interesting struggle I had with the birds. Uh, as I say, some of you have already heard that story. If you're not on that list, Go over to pathstoincome.com. Be shocked by the sheer minimalism of that squeeze page, which amazingly to me works. And enter your email address and you'll get interesting little tidbits from me on that sort of topic. Anyway, this week what I want to do is cover some things that happened while Gene Epstein week was going on. So I'd already planned out Gene Epstein week. And then these developments occurred and what was I going to do? So the first, not necessarily in the order in which we're going to cover it, But the first is what happened in the UK elections. Obviously, that's on a lot of people's minds. The second thing is what we now know because of the Washington Post story about a deliberate campaign to mislead the public about the progress or lack thereof in the war in Afghanistan. Obviously, I want to talk about that. And that is not getting nearly the response it should. That's partly because the impeachment's going on, but it's also because I think On the left, there's just no interest in war. They've just been told you've been brazenly lied to. And these same people, I was on Twitter uh, a few days ago, and there was somebody who had written a scholarly article about fake news on Pinterest. Fake news on Pinterest? You're worried about Pinterest? You just found out that the regime's been lying to you and that obviously the media class has completely failed you because it obviously didn't ask any hard questions. And you're worried that on Pinterest you might get fake news about what? On Pinterest about what? Meanwhile, the longest war in American history has been sustained by the usual BS and lies. It's like nothing. Nothing. I, I don't understand these people at all. At all. That this could go on and it just doesn't seem to bother them at all. And it doesn't cause them to rethink their worldview. It doesn't cause them to rethink their naive trust in the deep state. None of it. And to think these are the people who have the nerve to call themselves the resistance. These people are the resistance. Could you imagine that? If in the American War for Independence, what would have happened if those people were the so-called resistance? Okay. (sighs) All right, so what are we going to do today? So I am going to cover those topics this week. We'll get Scott Horton on, talk Afghanistan tomorrow. Then the next day, we'll talk to an entrepreneur friend I have in London who's also been active in libertarian causes for a long time, who has been my go-to guy on what's happening in the news over there. That's Toby Baxendale, by the way, for those of you who have maybe who are informed about, or or perhaps in the UK yourself, you may be familiar with Toby Baxendale. Great guy, I've had him on before. And I asked him if he'd come on and tell me what's really happening. Because I want to get the perspective of somebody who's not really in one party or the other. Maybe he has sympathies for one party over the other, we'll find that out. But who can really give us an objective overview of what's happening. Because you you get hysteria from one side or another from the media. You get tears or you get cheers. 
And I want to know what's the reality of the situation. So we'll take care of that. But I thought I would do a short episode today on a couple of articles I've been reading that I think you guys would benefit from. And they're by a fellow I've had on the program before, and that's Angelo Cotavilla. And he is a professor emeritus of international relations at Boston University. And very insightful. And to me, just the mere fact that he exists and writes what he writes is newsworthy itself. That anybody on the so-called right wing in America would be saying what he's saying is itself noteworthy, is extremely noteworthy. Now, he's not getting the attention he should be getting. Now, I did see a blog post about him on Mises.org recently. So, as usual, the Mises Institute is plugged into things. But in the rest of the libertarian world, this guy may as well not exist. And I, that, to me, makes no sense at all. Cota Villa had been writing for a while about foreign policy and against neoconservative foreign policy, which is not only a great thing to see on the right wing in general, but in particular in the Claremont Review of Books was where he was writing. Now, the Claremont Institute is a Straussian neocon institute out on the West Coast. And I've talked a number of times on this program about who the Straussians are, what they believe, and where their ideas come from. But in general, the Straussians tend to have a, a very neocon approach to foreign policy and a very nationalistic approach to domestic policy. And, and by nationalistic, I don't mean Donald Trump populism style. I mean nationalism in the way the whole regime believes in nationalism, which is they hate regionalism, they hate the states, they hate localities. They want judges to tell everybody in the country what to do. And in that respect, they sound not all that dissimilar from a lot of the official libertarians I encounter, uh, even some on the left. And this just baffles me, but I've quit bothering to try to figure out how left libertarians think. It is fruitless, and I'd rather devote my life uh, to enjoying myself in St. Lucia than to figure out some insoluble problem. But they would believe, for example, that why it would be treasonous to believe in or carry out nullification, state nullification of unconstitutional federal laws, and uh, – you know, I can find some of these establishment libertarians who might grudgingly allow for that approach. But if you look at the official libertarian think tanks, they're all dead set against it. Because because you understand, the idea of the states nullifying unconstitutional federal laws is not something the New York Times has permitted us to believe. And so in order to show that we are tamed and domesticated and no threat to anybody, we make sure and stand up and say, we agree with you. Why, that would be unthinkable, oh, Mr. New York Times reporter, sir. No, why, we are here simply to release irrelevant policy reports that go immediately into the trash can. We're not actually trying to affect events. And in fact, we shall help you by enforcing your decrees against our people. We shall demonize anyone in the libertarian movement who actually does want to change things, who actually wants to do something other than issue policy reports that go in the garbage can. We shall demonize those people. Why, these people are neo-Confederates. Like, we will even use stupid fourth-grade level Marxoid neologisms that you gave us in order to demonize our own people so that you will understand that we belong at your cocktail party this Christmas. Uh, I beg your pardon, this holiday season. So that's what's happening. So that's why people like that don't pay any attention to Cota Villa. But it's interesting that Cota Villa is saying things like this and that he's saying them in the outlets where he's saying them because Cota Villa is now arguing that this is precisely what we need, is radical decentralization, including nullification. This is obviously what we need at a time like this. And for Claremont to endorse somebody like this is very significant because as good Straussian neocons, they have – for years and years, demonized people like your host here, uh, like Kevin Goodsman. Kevin Goodsman couldn't possibly be considered a neo-Confederate by anybody's definition. He has repeatedly made that clear. And of course, <laughs> like all people with, uh, frankly, leftist instincts, they cannot make distinctions. They are incapable of making distinctions. So Newt Gingrich equals Tom Woods equals Ron Paul equals Pat Buchanan equals Donald Trump for these people. I mean, I, I, you know, that's how the left thinks. They cannot, you know, the Koch brothers, I mean, it's just as soon as they start talking about the Koch brothers, just tune them out. They, they don't know what they're talking about. Just tune them right out. So for years, I've been demonized in their pages and nothing about me changed 
And then suddenly I got a great book review of my book, Meltdown, that they gave me a tremendous review. And I was really, really pleased about that. They said, this book may actually force us to rethink our positive attitudes about Alexander Hamilton. I thought, wow, I just made a really, really big step forward for these people. That's amazing. So that's great. And uh, likewise, even though I was demonized for these precise views years and years and years ago by a certain libertarian magazine, well, again, nothing about me changed in the interim, and that libertarian magazine then featured me on their YouTube channel for an ex what I took to be a fairly favorable uh, interview that was very pleasant. So it's it's almost like they're saying, yeah, okay, we went a little overboard here. Obviously, there's nothing sinister about saying that maybe one city governing 330 million diverse people and handing down edicts for all of them to follow might not, after all, be the best form of political association. Maybe, barring anarcho-capitalism, something like a regime that allows for decentralization might not actually be fascist, after all. <sighs> anyway, so Cotevilla has been writing some interesting material, and the fact, as I say, that it's been appearing where it's been appearing has been, to my mind, deeply significant. So there are two pieces. One's from 2019, just came out. Another one from 2017. I'll link to both of them at tomwoods.com slash 1556. And of course, also on that page, I'll link to the time I spoke to him myself. Now, in reviewing these with you, I'm going to read passages from them because they deserve to be read, just read the way they're read. Now, Cotevilla is writing as somebody who supports Donald Trump and supports him against both the Democrats and the mainline Republicans. I have a more ambiguous uh, view of Donald Trump in that I look at the things he does, and a lot of them make me crazy. I mean, even, even his worst libertarian opponents agree that in some areas he's obviously done some good, but they just think that the good is overwhelmingly outweighed by the bad. To me, the frustrating thing is he comes in with at least some kind of mandate, and instead of appointing people who are going to carry out that mandate, he appoints people who can't stand the sight of him and who want to undermine him at every turn with all the good instincts that he has. So obviously, like for example, the, the series of tweets he sent out about a month or two ago about the uh, getting involved in the Middle East is the worst decision we ever made and on and on and on about the endless wars. I've never heard anybody speak that way. There's nobody in the foreign policy establishment who's spoken that way over the past 50 years. There's no president who's spoken that way. Even Jimmy Carter didn't, didn't talk that way. And that is amazing. You say, yeah, but he's still, he keeps deploying troops. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right. Remember, I had twice the hair that I have now when he started as president. So believe me, I'm well aware of that. But as I say, I, I prefer somebody who at least flaps his mouth to somebody who doesn't even do that because at least it gets people thinking. It makes the right wing think, hmm, maybe we don't have to support the U.S. military all the time. Ah, okay. All right. Well, that's something. That's something. But then he surrounds himself with Pompeo and Bolton. And yeah, he fired Bolton. Everybody cheered that. You're cheering the firing of a guy he hired in the first place. So I mean, there are things, it's just crazy. But yet I know what he represents. And he represents a middle finger to the establishment. The establishment hates people like you and me. They don't just hate the so-called deplorables who voted for Trump. You think they're going to make a distinction between them and you? As I said, are these people known for their careful distinctions? We are all the same to these people. Because we don't bend the knee, because we don't go along with believing everything that the establishment wants us to believe, socially, economically, and otherwise, because we don't consent to be governed by experts on the grounds that we're too stupid to make our own decisions, we are just as deplorable as they are. They are not going to distinguish between the Trump people and us. Okay, we are all enemies and we are all to be destroyed. That is their attitude. And I love these Washington libertarians who think, well, if we could just sit down and talk to them and show how reasonable we are, that's not how this works. These people cannot stand the sight of you. And Cotevilla is talking about what needs to be done about that. So given that Trump represents a middle finger to those people, that I do like because those people deserve the middle finger. And I'm not, I'm not the sort of guy who gives people the middle finger. But in this, in this way, I kind of like it. And of course, he does represent, at least in principle, if not in practice, some kind of a monkey wrench thrown into the works of the foreign policy establishment. 
And I wish he were more consistent and I wish he was surrounded by people who supported what he at least claims to want. Yes, of course I get all that. But if he didn't at least represent that, he would not be attacked the way he is. That is just a fact. That is what they see in him. Whether they should see it or not is another matter, but that is obviously what they see in him. And therefore, he's to be destroyed. And he has dared to say, well, I'm not sure I necessarily trust this or that institution, intelligence agency or whatever. And to see these former flower children on their fainting couches because a president says he doesn't trust the, the FBI or something. I mean, these people have no principles whatsoever. Now, all of a sudden, the FBI is to be loved. The CIA is to be loved. These are the same people who wouldn't have believed a word these institutions said in their own day. But when, it depends on whose ox is being gored, when their opponent is up against them, well, that changes everything. Well, if you had any principles whatsoever, it wouldn't change a thing. And these people have no principles. All right, I'm getting a little intense here. So let me take it down a notch for a minute to tell you, of course, you know, Christmas is coming and we love giving gifts, and we love finding bargains. And you can do that with Honey very easily. Honey is a free browser extension. It automatically finds the best promo codes whenever you shop online. So you always get the best deals without even trying on over 20,000 sites. So Amazon, eBay, J. Crew, Expedia, Target, Best Buy, stores like that. I was actually buying a couple of toys for my kids from a department store I've never ordered from online before. And instantly I saved $8.75 without even trying. I'd actually left the computer. I came back and Honey had found me a little bit of money to save. And this has happened repeatedly, both for myself and for purchases I've made for other people. So it's a very, very pleasant surprise. Honey has found its over 10 million members over a billion dollars in savings, and it's got over 100,000 five-star reviews on the Google Chrome store. So if you're buying gifts this holiday season, then you need Honey. If you're not, you probably know someone who is, so do them a solid and tell them about Honey. Honey can help make sure that you're getting the best price for whatever you're buying. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash woods. That's joinhoney.com slash woods. All right, so here we go with Cota Villa. He says, were Donald Trump to be reelected in 2020, as is likely, there is no reason to think his second administration would loosen the ruling class's tightening grip on our lives any more than the first did. So again, notice he's not naive about Trump. Were any Democrat to win, we can be certain that the demands on us would escalate and the government's chokehold on education, speech, religion, medicine, law, and all manner of administration would tighten further. In either case, after the 2020 elections, ordinary Americans will have to deal with the same dreadful question we faced in 2016. How do we secure and perhaps restore our fast diminishing freedom to live as Americans? And while we may wish for help from Trump, we have to look to ourselves and to other leaders for how we may counter the ruling class's manifold assaults now and especially in the long term. Since what the ruling class does is driven by its identity, whoever would lead us deplorables must leave no doubt that his own, at the very least, is in opposition to theirs. In other words, he has no desire to join the ruling class or to be liked by them, that he understands the harm the ruling class has done to America, and that he is on the side of those who wish to save and repair what is possible to save and repair. All right, well, that's I love that sentiment because I know very, very few people who don't want to be liked by the ruling class, especially spokesmen for libertarianism. Oh my gosh, are these people desperate to be loved? And that is a very, very dangerous kind of person to have in any kind of authority, whether it's the president of a think tank or uh, running a political party or whatever it is. The desire to be loved is extremely dangerous because it's a powerful, powerful temptation people need that. It gives them a rush that they're loved and respected and spoken well of in elite circles. And there are a lot of things people will sell out in exchange for that feeling. Very dangerous. And the fact that he writes this way is just so refreshing to me that what we need is somebody who makes darn clear, I don't, I don't care what you people think of me. And if you call me a this or a that, all these names, I know why you're calling me that. It's not because you actually think that I sit around thinking, what can I do to oppress members of this group today? Nobody thinks that way. I mean, maybe there's a handful of people 
on the margins of society, despised by everybody and with no money or, or resources. Maybe that. But normal people do not even remotely think that way. And the ruling class knows you don't think that way. Okay. I mean, the ruling class may be ignorant of, you know, basic facts about Western civilization, but they're not stupid intelligence wise. They don't actually think that you wish ill to a variety of groups. Okay. They're not dumb enough to think that. They're just trying to destroy you, if that makes you feel any better. They don't actually think you're a racist. Okay. They're just trying to destroy you. So I hope that consoles you in some way. And what Cota Villa is saying is we need somebody who does not care at all that he's being called these names. Because normal people all know what these names mean. It means you, you're an enemy of the regime. That's all it means. It does not mean anything else. It means you won't be dictated to by the regime. And you continue to think thoughts that are not dictated by the regime. That's all those names mean. So it's funny to me to see uh, left-wing libertarians throwing these names around at people like they're really meaningful. And I want to tell them that's not what these words are for. I mean, it's very sweet that you take them at face value and you think these are names meant to designate people who want to harm people. That's not what they're there for. And that's not why the regime uses them. Continuing with Cota Villa, that means a combative attitude. Donald Trump has been all too combative in generalities. But we are looking for leadership in many fields of sociopolitical combat. Specific leadership requires attitudes regarding specific problems, such as education and infrastructure. Whoever would be followed will have to explain what he or she is angry about, why, and what kind of action he encourages. To lead is to show the way, to explain what is to be done and how it's to be done, and to do it passionately. And then continuing with Cota Villa, since whoever claims to care about everything cares about nothing, we will take seriously only persons who have cared enough about causes to expose themselves to slings and arrows on their behalf as Charles de Gaulle put it, to pay with their own coin. Now, again, you'll forgive me if I draw analogies to the libertarian movement, but yeah, if you come out and say, I favor state nullification, and I can show you that Thomas Jefferson thought so too, and that there's actually a tremendous unknown history of it in the United States, and that uh, no, the Civil War did not resolve this, whatever that in the world that's supposed to mean, and that uh, no, uh, it is has not overwhelmingly has not been used to oppress people, but has been used to fight against the state again and again and again, starting in the 1790s. Yeah, I can make a tremendous case for that. And nobody can debate against me on that. No one can win. I know more about that than anybody. I wrote the book on nullification called Nullification. I wrote that book. Uh, link to tomwoods.com slash 1556. Get the free audio book over at tomwoodsaudio.com. But even though I know all the stuff, and even though I can answer all their ridiculous arguments about, well, isn't this a, a way to oppress minorities? It's just, I cannot believe the ignorance here. Even though I can answer all those arguments really well, none of that matters. They're going to attack me anyway. They're going to call me stupid Marxist names like neo-Confederate. They're going to call me all these ridiculous. I mean, nobody with any self-respect ever uses the word neo-Confederate, okay? You should laugh at people who use that word. It doesn't even mean anything, all right? So, no normal person uses that word, but of course we're dealing with lizard people. So you are going to get attacked and you're going to be smeared and your motives are going to be impugned. None of the left libertarians who attack me have ever had that happen to them. Not ever. Because they make sure that they hold what are at least, you know, yeah, they may be a little edgy for the New York Times, but they make sure that when it comes to something like this, they are on the right side. Because they know anybody saying anything like this is going to get in trouble and demonized. So you can always be sure if it's something that's actually going to cost them in terms of reputation and image, they'll be on the other side. Every single time, they will be on the other side. They have no idea what it's like to take a position and be truly demonized for it. I know what that's like. They have no idea because, frankly, most of them are cowards. And one thing they can't stand among them is somebody who's not a coward. So that person has to be demonized so they'll feel better about themselves. All right, carrying on. This is now from the, um, now we move on to the earlier piece by Cota Villa. And he says, the government apparatus identifies with the ruling class's interests, proclivities, and tastes, and almost unanimously with the Democratic Party. As it uses government power to press those interests, proclivities, and tastes upon the ruled, it acts as a partisan state. 
This party state's political objective is to delegitimize not so much the politicians who champion the ruled from time to time, but the ruled themselves. Ever since Woodrow Wilson nearly a century and a half ago at Princeton, colleges have taught that ordinary Americans are rightly ruled by experts because they are incapable of governing themselves. Millions of graduates have identified themselves as the personifiers of expertise and believe themselves entitled to rule. Their practical definition of discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, etc. is neither more nor less than anyone's reluctance to bow to them. It's personal. That's correct. And that's similar to what I was just saying. That's correct. That is what that stuff means. You are not bowing to the regime. That's what it means. So again, feel consoled, my dear listener. They don't actually think you're a mean person. They just want to destroy you. Isn't it funny? These are the same people, by the way, who lament the dangers faced by our democracy, our sacred democracy. These people don't don't care about democracy. They want to rule you. And they believe they're entitled to rule you. So if you choose the wrong person, that's not democracy anymore. Democracy means you are ruled by the managerial elites of the U.S. regime. That's democracy. And that's their definition of democracy around the world. So time and again, when people choose somebody the American regime doesn't like, this is suddenly not democracy anymore. So democracy, so again, it's so funny to see how many people in the United States are naive about this. Democracy to them does not mean that a majority of people get their way. That that is not the working definition of democracy. It means the officially approved mouthpiece of the managerial elite is chosen. That's what it means to them. And it does mean rule by your betters. That, as Cota Villa says, that's exactly what it means. What else could it mean for these people? Then he says, American society has divided along unreconcilable visions of the good, held by countrymen who increasingly regard each other as enemies. Any attempt by either side to coerce the other into submission augurs only the fate that has befallen other peoples who let themselves slide into revolution. It follows that the path to peace must lie in each side's contentment to have its own way, but only among those who consent to it. And then I love this example of Roger Williams. Ever since Roger Williams led his band out of Massachusetts to found Rhode Island, Americans have avoided contention by sorting out into more congenial groups. The Constitution was written to reflect the reality of very different ways of life, united by a common commitment to the laws of nature and of nature's God and to the supreme law of the land. And continuing with Cotevilla, much of the heat in contemporary American politics comes from the attempt, principally from the left, but increasingly from the right as well, to force the entire nation to live in precisely the same way with precisely the same values. Statesmanship should begin by questioning and moderating that tendency. Almost nobody in America is talking that way. And yet what could be more obvious? The hatred of one side for the other grows worse and worse every day. And what one side is demanding the other believe and publicly profess becomes more laughable and preposterous every day. How does this have an ending other than some kind of separation? And why would we want it to have an ending other than that? Why would we? Why would we think the best way for us to live is for us to spend our entire lives hectoring other people all day long and trying to punish them into submission? Really? That's how you want to live your life? And then Cota Villa goes on to give examples of states that are resisting the federal government or localities. And he gives examples of resistance that take maybe a left-wing form, resistance that takes a right-wing form, and then says, really, are they actually going to send paramilitary forces into these localities to enforce federal law? It's just not going to happen. And we don't have the kind of shared moral commitments anymore where we would look at the federal government and say the the federal government is – an engine of righteous force. People just don't look at it that way. And he also says that we should have a more modest foreign policy because when we have these crazy foreign interventions, these further divide us at home. We're already divided enough at home. And these divide us further for no real benefit. Now, I think here he's overstating his case because I think most people just don't care about foreign policy, Uh, particularly the left. The left clearly does not care. The left does not care about foreign policy. Uh, that's been obvious in the Trump years and even before. You know, they can joke and laugh about Hillary Clinton, but if she had done to black Americans what she did say to Libya, well, she'd be a pariah, right? But see, black Americans are Americans, 
and the left liberals sentiments extend only so far. I mean, Libya is really far away, folks, whereas Americans are all around you in the United States, right? So they could not care less. They joke with her and take pictures with her because what she did to people far away just doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter. Even their perfunctory stuff about war isn't to be taken seriously. And the same, same with the stuff about, you know, everybody's a racist. That, they don't believe that. If they believe that, they wouldn't be encouraging immigration. They would be urging foreigners to stay the heck away from this place. This is a dangerous place full of racist people who wish you ill. If that's what they believe, they would, it would be extremely irresponsible of them to promote immigration. So, so even they don't really believe what they're saying. These words are weapons for them. Everything is a form of war for these people. Everything is some form of war. Don't take what they do at face value. It's all a form of war. And it's a war against, frankly, you and me. And you think, oh, but I'm not a Trump person. You think they care? You're not on board with them? You're on the other side. That's all they need to know. All right, on that cheery note, we're going to wrap things up here. But I want to leave with a question here. Because what, Cota Villa does not talk directly about secession here. You know, he does talk about radical decentralization. There is a book coming out by Professor Buckley at uh, George Mason University Law School, whom I've had on before, on American secession and the prospects for it. That's coming out in January 2020. I'm going to try to get him on and talk about that. But I guess my question would be, where do I go? Because although I feel more comfortable on the right than I do on the left, I don't really identify with those people either. I mean, I just shake my head when I I think, well, they've had years to figure out the nature of things. Surely they're not still saying, you know, they're not still naive about the police and the military, and they're not still talking about, you know, using the expression, my president, and surely they're not thinking of a U.S. president as an instrument of of Christ. And I mean, surely, right? Surely they've become less naive since I last checked on them. You know? And then I turn around, they, they think all these things. They, they've, they've moved not one inch. And maybe they've gotten a little better on foreign policy. I don't know, maybe. But wow, these people make me crazy. So where do libertarians go if there's some form of separation? Where do we go? Where's our place? Where's uh, libertarians stand? I don't know. We got we to gotta flesh this all out. But for now, I will say we've got some great, timely topics coming up for you uh, this week. And uh, what else do I want to say before I depart from you? Oh, yes, another thing. Obviously, education is where people are getting, in in the schools, is where people are getting trained to think a certain way. And you know, I hope by now, that I helped to create courses for the Ron Paul homeschool program, the Ron Paul curriculum. And in there, you are going to get both sides. You are actually going to hear alternative ways of looking at American history, or economics, and all these things that you expect. But what you don't expect is that in addition to that, we have courses that almost nobody else has, like how to start a, a, your own small business. This is the sort of thing that even if you can't get a job, you can do this. We're going to teach you how to write advertising copy. Now, that's the sort of thing even, uh, in my opinion, dumb libertarians look down upon. You know, they, they look down their noses at stuff like that. But that's what makes capitalism go around. And if you're good at writing advertising copy or email marketing copy, you will not be poor, okay? You will not be poor. That is a skill that if you have it, you're going to be way ahead of everybody else. Or how about a course on personal finance for teens so that our people, when they go out in the world, will know what to do with their money. So that's the stuff you don't expect in the Ron Paul curriculum. So we're getting to the point of the school year where we're, we're just about halfway through. And this is when a lot of parents decide, I need to make a change because I hate what we're doing now. The beauty of the Ron Paul program is it's self-taught. So you don't have to run yourself ragged going to each student and teaching them stuff. It's self-taught and video-based. And it is going to save your mental health. And you're going to be taught by, well, people like your host here. If you decide that's something you love, that, that appeals to you, then obviously subscribe to the program through my link because I also throw in bonuses that you're not going to believe that you can get only from me. So find this all out, get all the details at ronpaulhomeschool.com. That is my special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. So go do that and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.
Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.